dominance. You have to be a dominant defense. They hurt people. They, they, they was out there to hurt people. How could that defense not be on the list? That's, that list is bogus. How do you rate the greatest defenses of all time? Yards given up, points allowed, records set? Maybe you shouldn't even try. You really can't truly compare defenses from different eras because the rules are different. Great defenses are going to be great regardless of the rules. It could be two-hand touch, it could be flag. Whatever the rules are, the great defenses are going to be great. We rank the greatest defenses based on their number of Hall of Famers, championships won, key stats, and years of dominance. I told you, Swan! You turn your butt! There are defenses who have great days. But great defenses have great game after great game after great game. Well, to me, two stats matter. Points and turnovers. Don't allow points, get turnovers. You have a great defense. You need one or two complete lunatics. You can't hurt this. I'm a machine, jerk. Jack Tatum, Richard Dent, who is a little bit off his rocker. Ronnie Lott on the Niners. Lawrence Taylor, who was a maniac. The 2000 Ravens and the 85 Bears and the Steel Curtain. If I'm in the opposing team, I am myself when they come out of the tunnel. I look at those eyes. I am scared. I have wet pants. I have a mess in the back. That's what I look at when I'm talking about great defenses of all time. The number 10 defense of all time, the Purple People Eaters. The Purple People Eaters. You're talking about going back to a song in 1958. When I had one horn... Flying purple people eaters. Purple people eaters in Minnesota? Come on, what does that mean? It sounds like an acid trip. Then again, it was the 60s and early 70s. I think I remember asking, did they really eat people, Dad? He goes, in a way they do, son. In a way they do. Look here, I ain't lying, baby. Let's, Let's win this game. Let's, Let's win this game. Let's go. Can anything be more intimidating than four big guys with steam coming out of their helmets wearing purple? No. 1,000 pounds of rough tough and mean. One half ton of hit and smack and sock and tear. Four relentless men. All for one and one for all. Iron Man Jim Marshall, Gary Larson and Hall of Famers Carl Eller and Alan Page comprise the Vikings front line. In 1969, all four made the Pro Bowl. Minnesota allowed just nine and a half points per game, second fewest in NFL history. They were a cold-hearted horde who pillaged pass pockets for a decade. I played with them and I played against them. This defense was as good as any. I really think they're not 10. I think they're the greatest defensive line that ever lived. They were the embodiment of Minnesota. Cold, frozen field, and you saw teams intimidated by the fact that they had to deal with this defense. They were nasty. Uh, defensive ball players take pride in, in knowing that they're rough and that they're tough and that they're mean and that you really have to just hit and smack and sock and tear. Our number 10 defense isn't higher for four reasons. Four Super Bowl losses, each one worse than the one before. They just couldn't stop those running games of the AFC teams when they got to the Super Bowls and never do in the game that mattered most what they were able to do all season long. The Purple People Eaters must have got old by the time we got them. They were not the Purple People Eaters. They weren't eating that day. They weren't on a diet. Holy Toledo! The Oakland line is just wiping out Minnesota's front. Those were four opportunities that we had to prove that we were the best in the world, and we didn't do it. You never get over things like that. The Purple People Eaters. No rings, but nasty Norsemen nonetheless, and number 10 on our list. 
Many great defenses have been overshadowed by offensive stars. We had so many bright lights on offense, people didn't notice the defense. San Francisco won Super Bowls in the 80s with Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, but they also had two Hall of Famers on defense, Fred Dean and Ronnie Lott. The 49er entire defensive wall was in his face. That's what we're here for, kick the ass. I don't know that they would have had as many Super Bowls as they did if it wasn't for that defense. Maybe they might not have had any. The Eagles had high-flying Randall Cunningham, but when he was grounded by injury in 1991, Gang Green became the last defense to allow the fewest rushing yards and passing yards in a single season. Played him twice a year. It was unbelievable. But he sucked again! And they would be one of the top defenses of all time, except they didn't win anything. It was another defense that took a back seat to their offense that's sitting pretty on our list. The number nine defense of all time, Doomsday of the 1970s. The Doomsday defense. That's, by the way, the way you have to say that name. You can't just say, oh, oh, the Doomsday defense. Doomsday was a fully coordinated mixture of youth and experience, and their motto was, when the whistle blows, everybody goes. Doomsday was great. I thought that might have been the coolest nickname of any of these defensive units. In a way, it was not quite befitting of their play, not that these guys weren't tough or weren't hard hitters or anything like that, but Doomsday implies that they are actually going to kill you. And I don't think any of those guys would have actually killed the opponent. His name is Randy White. His nickname, Manster. I might be wrong about a couple of them. Our number nine defense may have been overlooked because of Dallas's high-powered offense, but their accomplishments are impressive. Three Hall of Famers and three of the eight defensive players to win the Super Bowl MVP award. Martin is buried, lets it fly, intercepted! The Doomsday defense statistically held its own against any, but wasn't like you found yourself in awe of this defense, except when you looked at the scoreboard and you saw that the other team didn't have a whole lot of success moving the ball or scoring points. And there is no Cowboys success, no America's team without that defense. The Cowboys wore those little gray Confederate uniforms. They lost one war. I don't have a lot of good to say about the Cowboys. I'm so tired of hearing about America's team. We would hear a lot of teams talking about us being a finesse team and not a physical football team. We would laugh at that and say, let's wait till Sunday and see what they say once they walk off the field. They just didn't have that mean aura about them. They had a more scientific, this is your gap, and we're going to not necessarily maul you, but we're going to play our position the way we're supposed to play it, the way Coach Landry wants us to play it. Knock them down now, okay? Knock your outside men down. you got to give Coach Landry an awful lot of credit. He knew what type of people he needed for his type of defense. They uh, studied an awful lot. They knew the other team extremely well. The doomsday defense, whose motto was, the strength of the pack is the wolf, but the strength of the wolf is the pack. Well, that defense was, you know, the everybody working together. The front four was a great front four. They had some great guys that could put a lot of pressure on the quarterback. It's Tall Jones, Harvey Mark, Randy White. They got him, Randy White. They were very good. They won a lot of games throughout the 70s running that defense. Doomsday dominated in an era of some of the greatest teams in NFL history, including their nemesis. The Steelers of those years were more physical than they were. Those Steelers teams beat them up more. Joe Green broke through to nail Starbuck and caused the fumble. The Dallas Cowboys, who the Steelers beat two of those Super Bowls, I feel are one of the greatest teams of all time, but ain't nobody ever going to know that because they didn't win as much as they would have had the Steelers not been around. Super Bowl 13 captured by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Every time they played, and usually when they did, it was in the Super Bowl, the Steelers beat them. Hence, the Steelers have more guys in the Hall of Fame, and I don't see how you can argue with that. The number eight defense of all time, the 2002 Tampa Bay Bucks. Number eight? You gotta be crazy. You look at all the Pro Bowl players that were on that unit. You look at the fact that Tony Dungy is a future Hall of Famer. Boy, that's got to be in the top five of all time. Our number eight defense finished in the top ten in fewest points allowed for an entire decade. I will tell how many Hall of Famers they had. Touchdown, Tampa Bay! We won the span of six full seasons, giving up 16.02 points. 
and I'll put that up against any defense. Hyper aggressive. Let's get medieval. Forcing turnovers. Oh, he's sick. Changing the outcome of games. All the way. Derek, you can walk from there. But to try to include them in the company of some of the other all time great defenses may be a little too high. You talk about Doomsday, you talk about the Steel Curtain, that defense is right there. See, all we needed was a cute name, and then we just jump up automatically. I don't know why the Bucks didn't have a nickname. You could have called them the Swashbucklers or something like that, but that's the name of the cheerleaders on the squad, so I don't think they would have been too appreciative of that. Come on, man. Pewter Pirates. Get out of here. You're about as dumb as a box of rocks. It was an offensive-minded coach who led our number eight defense to a championship. John Gruden came in and, and challenged us to, to do things even better. Hey, I'm not going to be a real patient guy now. Hey, what the f*** are you doing? I really believe that that 2002 defense was as good as there ever was. That year, with our nine returns for touchdowns, I think that puts us in an elite class that's beyond any defense before us or after us. Touchdown, Warren Sapp! Touchdown, Derek Brooks! Then everybody said they'll go down as one of the best, if not the best, if they can just win a Super Bowl. Well, we went and won a Super Bowl, and in our minds, I think that validates us as one of the greats. It's the greatest opportunity you can have in this game, and we're going to conquer it. Well, I remember specifically when they won that game, their desire, Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, Simeon Rice, all those guys said, now you have to put us with the greatest defenses of all time. We scored enough points in the Super Bowl to win it ourselves as a defense without one point from our offense. Touchdown, Tampa Bay! Derek Brooks all the way! Boom, boom! It was a dominant performance, there's no question about it, but because John Gruden knew the Raiders so well, he was the 12th guy on defense. The reason why it was so dominating was the Gruden knowledge. John's knowledge was great. I think in some circles a little overblown as to his impact on that game. Like every play they've run, we ran in practice. I know. It's unreal. Oh. But that's not the only team they did that to. The Buccaneers got to that Super Bowl by destroying other offenses, so we shouldn't diminish their achievement because Gruden had an edge on the Raiders. It's still a great defense in the top 10, but not any higher than maybe 10. Sure, we'll let them in the top 10, but on the outer edge, on the outer edge. Top 10 sounds good to me. <laughs> I think a defense um, probably has to be intimidating. That would be number one for me. The Fear Factor. The Rams' fearsome foursome of the 60s sure had it, but not quite enough to make our list. I look back at the physical attributes and the concentration and the teamwork that was there. We were a fearsome group. No defense struck fear in the hearts of their enemies like the Raiders of the 70s. George Atkinson and Tatum, if your nickname is the Assassin, I mean... <laughs> we looked at receivers as burglars breaking into your house. We were a tough group. I wouldn't want to be the guy to tell George Atkinson that he's not in the top 10 because, you know, he just might ask you to come over the middle, you know, and lay you guys out. Our defense is not in the top 10. Here come all the Raiders. Are you kidding me? It's a free for all. That breaks my heart. Holy Toledo. Well, the list is wrong. <laughs> Who made this list? The Raider defenses of the 70s had just two Hall of Famers and didn't rank among the NFL's all-time best and fewest points allowed. You got the feeling of more intimidation than frustration. You knew you were going to get your licks, but you also knew that you could move the ball on it. I, I couldn't put him up there. Sorry, Silver and Black fans, but our countdown pounds ahead without you. The number seven defense of all time, the 2000 Baltimore Ravens. Wow, 2000 Ravens defense, suffocating defense, tenacious, unrelenting, one of the all-time great defenses in NFL history, period. You had to bring extra Advil. You had to bring extra padding. They had two mammoth defensive tackles, Sam Adams and Tony Saragusa in the middle, and of course, Ray Lewis in the middle. Get in here, we gotta go fast now. We were always off. We got each other. We don't need nobody else. I got your back. You got my back. If I go to war, we go to war together. They had a lot of physical guys who like knocking people's heads off for the sake of doing it. Rod Woodson took all that and put it into a format. He showed those guys how to win. The 2000 Ravens are the best, probably the best run defense of all time. 
They set the NFL record for the fewest points and the fewest rushing yards allowed in a 16-game season. They're not going to be able to run. So, I mean, we, we just scratched that out. They cannot go on them. They can't even move the ball. We had four or five shutouts. We broke the scoring record. It was that magical year on the defensive side. There was a stretch of five games where they didn't score a touchdown. We're going to take a knee every snap. And they won two of the games. How does that happen? Like all great defenses, they were even better in the postseason. At its peak in the playoffs, that was a tremendously scary defense. In four playoff games, our number seven defense allowed just 23 points and one touchdown. He took it away from Eddie George and Ray Lewis, the defensive player of the year in the NFL, sealed the deal for the Ravens. Anytime you see Tony Saragusa falling on another man, you have to hide your eyes. Well, Saragusa's 340 pounds. He drove right into his midsection. Got all of them. It was not a pretty sight. You felt sorry for Rich Gannon, and you knew they were done. In the Super Bowl, Baltimore's defense destroyed the Giants. Led by MVP Ray Lewis, they allowed no touchdowns, got four sacks, and five turnovers. Slant over the middle, picked up by Dwayne Starks. He's got a touchdown. They did something that I think a lot of great defenses in the NFL might not be able to do. They carried Trent Dilfer to a world championship. That absolutely puts him on the list. The 2000 Ravens being ranked seven is way too low. Number seven. I'd like to see one through six. <laughs> They're not higher because of the lousy quarterbacks they faced. Slinging Spurgeon win. Ryan Leaf. Kent Graham. Doug Peterson. And Akili Smith. Not one all pro in the entire regular season. Seventh is good. Might want to go back and look at it again, but... Being in the top ten, I think that's good. The number six defense of all time, the Madison Avenue Giants. Let's pay tribute to the Giant defense. The Madison Avenue Giants absolutely belong on this list because they were the first ones that really popularized defense, that made people aware that there was a defense. From 1956 to 1963, our number six defense carried the Giants to six NFL championship games. Bolstered defensively by 11 men resembling Sherman tanks, the New York Giants win professional football's biggest prize. Everybody looked at the offensive players, you know, the Frank Giffords of the world, the Paul Hornings of the world. You know, they were kind of like the golden boys. Sam Huff and that Giant defense made it sexy, made it glamorous now to play defense in the NFL. Huff fields it on the bounce and runs five yards for a touchdown. Sam Huff, New York's great linebacker, has won more publicity for the pro game's defensive maneuvers than any other single player. It was a huge thing, not just for the Giants, but for all of pro football when Sam Huff, a defensive player, was on the cover of Time Magazine. Then they had this television show, The Violent World of Sam Huff, which really opened up the idea of defense in the NFL to the country. The man whose job is not to score, but to stop the score, is now Sunday's final. I always feel real good whenever I hit someone. Our number six defense had three Hall of Famers. Sam Huff. Huff cops the pass and goes 36 yards to score. Defensive end Andy Robustelli. I saw those Giants play many times. They did have a great defensive team with Andy Robustelli, a magnificent defensive end. And cornerback Emlyn Tunnell. Thomason now tries the air. The pass is picked off by Tunnell. They also had a Hall of Fame strategist whose tactics are still in use. Tom Landry, defense coach, dreams about a shutout. If we were going to be successful, we had to have the ability to, to stop the Cleveland Browns. They were the best team that I'd ever seen. So I decided to develop the 4-3 defense, and it became the hallmark of defense in the 50s. An unbelievable defense has held Brown to minus yardage. Mo checks him here, and Tunnell nabs him. Huff intercepts Plum on a spectacular catch, and a 10 to nothing defensive epic puts the Giants in the title game with the Colts. Despite six appearances, our number six defense only won one championship in 1956. United, to The chant of defense, defense. 
started in Yankee Stadium during that period with the Giants. Defense, defense. And to this day, when you ask people, how do you pronounce that word? People say defense, don't they? It's not the way it's pronounced. It's defense. Should be. Once more, keep your eye on the Giant defense. The Giant defense and those fans at Yankee Stadium changed a word of the English language forever. The Giant defense can be an offense, too. The number five defense of all time. The 2013 Seattle Seahawks. Defense wins championships. The Seattle Seahawks proved that that was the case. In 2013, Seattle's defense led the NFL in interceptions and points against while allowing the fewest yards. He's hit the ball, comes out, it's picked off by the Seahawks, Michael Bennett, touchdown! Seahawks! Our number five defense was led by its secondary, known as the Legion of Boom, or LOB. As Richard Sherman said one time, it's like you throw the ball against us, it's like throwing meat to wolves. Blood in the water. It's blood in the water. Time to hunt. The face and voice of the Legion of Boom belonged to Richard Sherman. I'm the best. Go home. This is my house. Tell him again. Tell him again. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a star receiver like Francis, that's the result you're going to get. Other teams may have had better stats and maybe more Hall of Fame caliber players, but as far as the Super Bowl, no defense of all time did what this Seahawk defense did to that Bronco team on Sunday. In Super Bowl 48, Seattle held Peyton Manning and the NFL's highest scoring offense of all time to just eight points. Holy Catfish! Touchdown, Seahawks! I ain't never seen a quarterback who can deal with the LOB. You better alert the Legion. They took the number one offense of all time and destroyed them, made them look stupid. They may as well have not even shown up to that game. That's how irrelevant they were. Your Seahawks, Super Bowl 48 champions. This wasn't just the top defense. I think it was one of the best defenses of all time. We've got them. L.O.B. As biased as we might be in Seattle, historically speaking, I would think Seattle should be no worse than number three. Put that freaking trophy up again. Hey! You know, you're only giving up 175 yards a game through the air in an era where quarterbacks are throwing for over 5,000 yards in a season. Where you look at some of the teams ahead of them, they could be as physical as they wanted to be with those receivers. This team isn't allowed to do that, and still they're able to play the way they play. L.O.B. I'm done. The number four defense of all time, the Redwood Forest, the 1969 Kansas City Chiefs. The 69 Chiefs team will be defined more by Len Dawson and Hank Stram than they would be by defense. Hank Stram, the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, stands apart as an original thinker. Hank Stram, as much as he prided himself on offensive play calling, 65 toss power trap, had a defense that really carried that football team. No! What? My God, can you believe that? Our number four defense is the only team of the Super Bowl era to finish first in all four major defensive categories. Fewest total yards, rushing yards, passing yards, as well as fewest points allowed. The fourth interception by the Chiefs. Great defense. The Chiefs in the late 60s. That is one of the great defensive football teams of all time. If you start looking at the front four, you had Jerry Mays you'd start a football team with. He was that good. Buck Buchanan in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Curly Culp defined the position of nose guard. We don't give them anything, man. We keep pouring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire. The linebackers, two of the three, Willie Lanier and Bobby Bell, they're in Pro Football Hall of Fame. Bobby Bell with a touchdown. Willie Lanier was a... Uh, whatever they said, redwood, oak tree, whatever, he was a stud. He looked like a Coca-Cola machine with a helmet on. <laughs> he was unbelievable. We've chased him into the end zone how many times? And the defensive secondary, you had Jimmy Marcellus, who invented the bump and run. You had Emmett Thomas, who was in the Hall of Fame. The center for 20 by Emmett Thomas. Where was a weakness on defense? We didn't have one. Every phase of their defense has a Hall of Famer. The front line the linebackers, the secondary. So what are you missing? You're missing nothing. 
In the 1969 playoffs, the defending Super Bowl champion Jets couldn't score a touchdown against our number four defense. We felt that no one can beat us anymore because of the type of defense that we had. In the AFL championship game, the Chiefs held the Raiders, the league's highest scoring team, to seven points. Unbelievable, relentless. You saw one, you saw two, you saw three. They were gang tacklers. They chased the ball down all over the field. Back to throw to Monica. He is sacked. Did he get free by Aaron Brown? This year, the AFL had another underdog representing it, a team that couldn't win its own division during regular season. 13 points underdog. Hey, wait a minute. That's the same. You guys shouldn't be on the same field. We said in the locker room, we got the best team here. In Super Bowl IV, our number four defense forced five turnovers against the NFL's highest scoring offense. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. The defense continues to play brilliantly. Taking a look at the playoff games in 1969 on our way to the Super Bowl, in those three games, our defense gave up a total of 20 points. Is that good? Yeah, that's damn good. Yes, sir, boys! <laughs> If you think our list favors defenses with nicknames, take a look at some of the all-time greats that missed the cut. In 1976, the Orange Crush was unveiled. Denver's Orange Crush defense of the late 70s featured four players who went to at least three Pro Bowls. Get down, Denver. Go on to the Super Bowl. But they were Orange Crushed in their only Super Bowl. Well, slam this over the goal post for the Orange Crush after this game. Miami's no-name defense won Super Bowl seven and eight. In both seasons, they gave up the fewest points in the NFL. I mean, we're undefeated. So how do they not make this list? What the hell are you doing? The no-name defense was dominant. To have them left off that list is a great travesty. All I can say is you got a bunch of dumb putting your list together. Easy now. The defense that did make our list didn't even need a nickname. The number three defense of all time. Lombardi's Packers. They were good. <laughs> they were good everywhere. It is the defense which gives Green Bay its personality as a team. They had a couple of defensive linemen that were in the Hall of Fame. They had linebackers in the Hall of Fame, defensive backs in the Hall of Fame. You look at Willie Davis. It was he who struck the deadly blows, which placed victory far beyond Minnesota's reach. Jordan's in the Hall of Fame. Henry Jordan. A crafty defensive tackle, Jordan is one of the most proficient pass rushers in the NFL. You had all-pro Herb Adderley. Speed, savvy, and a killer instinct make Herb Adderley one of the most feared deep backs in the game. You look at Willie Wood. Six years ago, Willie Wood joined the Green Bay Packers as a free agent. Today, he's an all-pro. But at the end of the day, you had to stop and take a look at Ray Nitschke. But if there is a player other teams love to hate, it's Ray Nitschke, number 66, Green Bay's all-pro middle linebacker. Besides their five Hall of Famers, the Packers of the 60s also had Pro Bowlers Dave Robinson and Leroy Caffey, who helped them earn five championships in seven years. The Green Bay Packers win the first Super Bowl game. Pursuit is a man's responsibility. Pursuit is dedication. Pursuit is persistence. And when you get there, you get there in an angry mood. And on the rare occasions when they didn't, their head coach, Vince Lombardi, was the one in the bad mood. Now let's get that defense up on the bit a little bit here now. It was like a, a drill sergeant in the Marines. Oh, we missed practice. I call him a little tyrant. Come on, tighten up out there, Green! Because that's what he was. Grab, grab, grab! Nobody tackle! Incredible defensive team on a pass defense team. I mean, they, they would routinely lead the league in fewest pass yards allowed. In 1967, the Packers allowed an amazing 4.88 yards per pass. And it was their secondary that took charge in their first Super Bowl. They were a veteran unit when we played them in Super Bowl One. I. I threw an interception in the second half, and that just completely turned things around because they ended up scoring. And it is intercepted. 
We hadn't had to play catch-up football. Uh, it was really tough. And Willie Wood intercepts and goes 51 yards. A Herb Adderley interception sealed the Packers' second straight Super Bowl victory. He was laying back waiting for that one. The best defense of the early 60s was not the Packers, the Detroit Lions. A fierce, violent defense has been a Detroit legacy for decades. The Detroit Lions with Alex Karras, Darius McCord, and Roger Brown. Joe Schmidt, Dick LeBeau, the great coach now, was a great cornerback. The Detroit Lions were just brutal to play against. But they had no offensive team, and they were Detroit, right? Which is, Detroit has always been clamped, then and today. A defense like the Lions gets overshadowed because they didn't win championships. All right, let's work out there. Let's work out there now. Our number three defense is quite deserving of its ranking, not just because of the many championships they won, but because of the way they won. They played the game hard, and they played the game hurt, the way a legendary defense should, the way their legendary head coach demanded. Lake Michigan is frozen solid. We've got blizzards on the way. Well, how about we inflict a little pain on people who come here to visit? That's what Chicago's defenses have done for decades. In the 40s and 50s, number seven, Ed Sprinkle, was the headhunter, while the 60s were dominated by massive Doug Atkins. Doug Atkins was like a storm rolling over a Kansas farmhouse. He came from all directions, and all there was to do was to tie down what you could and hope he didn't take the roof. The 70s were ruled, of course, by bloodthirsty beast Dick Buckus. Butkus's defense. Butkus is knocking people out. Butkus is so tough that people name their bulldogs after him. The 84 Bears logged 72 sacks, the NFL record. In 86, Chicago allowed the fewest points ever in a 16-week season until the 2000 Ravens came along. They beat us about 46 to nothing. We had one of the top offenses in all of football, and they humiliated us. But only one of the great Windy City defenses made our top ten list. Woo, 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 woo. The number two defense of all time, the 1985 Bears. Mike, man, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to get that first. Dent was saying, no, I'm getting that first. And, and I'm looking at these guys, and I'm saying, wait, wait, the guy is bleeding. You don't have to kill the guy. We don't care. We're going to get him. That's what we do. They put the fear of God into every team that they played, and I think they won at least seven or eight games during the warmups. They might as well just brought in Romans and had lions there to eat these people because it was over. You could see absolute fear in the quarterback, and rightly so. It reminded you of one of those Jacques Cousteau shows. He told the children to let the sharks go into a feeding frenzy. That's what it was like because it was like one would hit you, then another one hit you. As that season went on, it became relentless. It was everybody did it. You know, it was Mingo, it was Richard, it was Otis, it was Marshall. I can still see the lick he put on Joe Ferguson out in Detroit. I'd never seen him like it. I thought he killed him. <laughs> Chicago's defense not only hit hard, it studied hard under defensive coordinator Buddy Ryan. Buddy Ryan invented the 46 defense, a bold system which unleashed overwhelming numbers against quickly overrun blockers. Nobody could figure it out. It was just coming from everywhere and breathing down your neck. They were ruthless. The 46 worked because of Hall of Famer Dan Hampton. Athletic 350-pound rookie defensive tackle, William the Refrigerator Perry. Cat quick pass rusher Richard Dent. And tough as nails safety Gary Fensick. But the real key to the 46 were the linebackers. 
Otis Wilson was strong and incredibly athletic, a very, very good basketball player. Wilbur Marshall gets like a bullet coming at you, and he was ferocious and strong enough to take on anything that they would throw at him on the line of scrimmage. And then, of course, Mike Singletary. I mean, it was clear we were watching a Hall of Famer. This is a Hall of Famer building his career, and it was, uh, it was magnificent. I like this kind of party! Be smart, let's go right down here. there's 10 of men, let the right defense here. go to work. Right right here. You know, a lot of people think Chicago's the best team of all time, and it's because of the way that defense played in the playoffs, not the regular season. In two bitter cold playoff games at home, the Bears' defense made history with back-to-back -back shutouts. Third down, 11 yards to go for Dieter Brock and company. Brock back to pass, the rush out to oh. shut out the Giants in the playoffs. They shut out the Rams in the playoffs. They annihilated the Patriots in the Super Bowl. You know, Tony, Tony Eason was looking for places to hide under the carpet there in New Orleans. Then they battered Steve Grogan and won the game by halftime. Eighty-five Bears. That's the best defense. I'd put them number one on any list. Eighty-five Bears defense should have been number one. I mean, just a phenomenal team. Oh my goodness. The reason they're not is their only loss of that eighty-five season, a defeat that spelled the beginning of the end for the forty-six. They got beat by a team from Miami, I think. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Dan Marino exposed them when he threw the short passes, quick releases, getting rid of the ball. Then it kind of broke up. That one year just went <laughs> went away, you know? <laughs> Buddy Ryan went away the next year, followed by Wilson and Marshall. But the memories of that 85 defense will always remain. You have your benchmark, and that's the 85 best for me. I mean, when you talk a benchmark defense, you got to start there. I'll tell you what, this defense has been incredible. <laughs> They knock your socks off just to watch it. No matter how good the defenses are now, the Ravens, everybody, they're compared to the 85 Bears. What are they, unblockable? Is that the 85 Bears over there? They were a perfect defense at a perfect time in a perfect city. And, uh, I mean, that's why they're remembered so fondly, I think. And now, the number one defense of all time, the Steel Curtain. The Steeler defense was the best defense I ever saw. Clearly the best defense. If anybody thinks otherwise, they're wrong. Number one defense of all time, the Steelers of the 70s. How can you argue it? Number one! Number one! The Steel Curtain won four Super Bowls and had four Hall of Famers. It's hard to make an argument against them topping our list. Chuck Noll's Steel Curtain was the greatest defense in history because back then they had to beat the Raiders, great teams. Had to beat the Cowboys, great teams. The Dolphins, the competition the Steel Curtain went up against year in and year out was unprecedented. No defense frightened opponents the way this one did. I mean, I think opponents were worried to the point of losing sleep the night before facing the Steeler team. Hear that ball loose and get after their ass. They certainly weren't rolling out the West Coast offense with Joe Montana's golden locks. They were bruising you and beating you. I'm going to hit it hard. Everybody on that team, whether it was a secondary or the linemen, were just ferocious. The line, the linebackers, the secondary all the way through, nasty. I mean, Joe Green, before he did the coke ad. He had other great defensive linemen, too, like the L.C. Greenwood. Someday, L.C. Greenwood will be in the Hall of Fame, too. There's the safety. L.C. Greenwood sacked him. You had Jack Ham, the best outside linebacker ever. Jack Ham shot him down. You had Jack Lambert, who was just dirty, vicious, filthy in the middle. Do you ever have a better poster for an intimidating defense than a man coming at you with no front teeth. That'd cool your ass off. Mel Blunt came up with the interception. Mel Blunt's the best cornerback ever. Receivers would go, they would start crying if they had to go against Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt, I believe, killed a wide receiver during an exhibition game, and the NFL hushed it up. That's how tough he played. One of the things that I always wanted to do was let people know that this is my territory. If you come in here, you're going to have to pay. Pittsburgh won Super Bowls both before and after the rules changes in 1978. But it was 1976, a year they didn't win a championship, 
when the curtain came down the hardest. What was their best year? I would say 1976. 1976. Look it up. They started out one and four because Bradshaw was hurt. And all he did was run the ball and play great defense. And they won nine in a row. The playoffs were nine games away. Pittsburgh vowed to win them all. The defensive players said, hey, look, if we're going to get back to the Super Bowl, if we're going to salvage this season, we're going to have to do it. And we can't allow a point. And they darn near did it. The defense is closing in on its fifth shutout in nine games. Oh, we. You look at the scores of the 1976 Steelers, the opponents' point totals, 0 0 0 0 0. It was astonishing the level at which that defense played, I think, is unmatched in Steeler history and maybe unmatched in all of football. There are three reasons why the Steel Curtain is above the 85 Bears. They had three more Super Bowl rings, two more Hall of Famers, and they were the preeminent defense in the NFL over a longer period of time. The Steel Curtain wasn't just, okay, the planets lined up for us one time. It was several years of consistent domination. I would have loved to have seen that defense. The Steelers against the Chicago Bears. Because these two defenses got after people, and they were dominant. I think he had a 0-0 tie in the 12 overtimes.